Hello, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Our spring fundraising campaign is off to a good start, but we could really use your help to reach our goal. For all of the difficulties and discouragements that can come from the preaching life, I'm reminded through this ministry that people love this work. Preaching brings joy, not just in the preaching moment and preparations, but in knowing that you're not in it alone. Here at Working Preacher, you can find a community of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination to help you engage with the Bible through diverse perspectives from a diverse range of interpreters who all reside in different social locations and some of whom have different theological hunches. We rely on the generosity of donors like you to carry out Working Preacher's ministry, and I hope we can rely on your support this May. And don't forget, after you make a gift to our spring campaign, we will send you an ebook from Working Preacher titled Sustaining the Preaching Life. It's a short ebook which echoes the theme of this year's Festival of Homiletics, which is happening this week in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And a shout out to all of you who are attending the festival. The ebook includes articles and commentaries curated by the Working Preacher team, meant to help preachers relearn ways to care for themselves and to discover new habits to support the preaching life. It's exclusively available to those who donate to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign before May 31st. Even if you're not a preacher, you can share it with a preacher whom you care about. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift securely online before May 31st. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And this is the podcast for May 19th, 2024, Pentecost Sunday. And the readings are Acts 2, 1 through 4, the a very just briefest part of the Pentecost story, and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 13. We've been in 1 Corinthians for the last couple of weeks. And so we uh, we tie together that passage on the gifts of the Spirit, uh, fruit of the Spirit, uh, and which is Galatians, but, and then Pentecost. So um, a, a word, a, a, a word about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, and uh, I think it goes all the way back when we think about this to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul says to the, to the body as a whole, using you plural, um, you lack no spiritual gift, which I think is a little dig there, um, that they need each other, that only together do we not lack um, a spiritual gift because no one has them all. Yeah, and I think this is one of those places, too, where it's important to look at the different ways in which Paul talks about spiritual gifts in his other letters. So in Galatians, perhaps, is one of the more famous ones, the fruits of the Spirit. So that we see that he's not giving comprehensive lists of gifts, that it's not that in order to be a good Christian or a perfect Christian, you have to have every single one of these gifts, and there's something to be counted up or cultivated or so forth. When I think what you said is really important, he sees them as part of this whole collective body of Christ, that we each bring these different gifts and that the Spirit pours out different gifts on all of us, and that by bringing these gifts together, that is how the body of Christ is maintained and strengthened and how we live together into that community. So again, that these aren't things, they're sometimes thought of as things that we're all supposed to cultivate each and every one of them. But it's a, it's a slightly different metaphor than that, that I think we need to pay attention to here in 1 Corinthians. I appreciate that. Uh, both of you, uh, in um, the larger context of which this letter uh, can be read, and uh, one of the situations that uh, I always pay attention to in, in uh, reading um, of this first church uh, letter from Corinth is uh, that uh, they were in their worship services or their gathered times together had become chaotic. And um, sometimes when um, we think about Pentecost, we think of it as a chaotic moment. And in actuality, it became a gathering moment. Uh, it was the holiday where um, the Jews uh, in diaspora from all over came together together 
which basically represented the reality that they they were all over the world. And so they represented different ethnic groups, different languages, different cultures. And what happened at Pentecost was they all heard the good news in a language that they understood. And so when we think of that as the context, that short reading of the Pentecost uh, moment uh, recorded in Acts, and then we think about the chaos of the gathering that uh, Paul is addressing, we can also remember this metaphor of uh, what I like to say, the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bone connected to the leg bone. We can just sing that all the way through. But that that was a familiar um, metaphor, but it was used to maintain the Roman and Greek caste system. And what Paul is actually doing is turning that divisive metaphor on its head by what you just said, Rolf, is that we can't do this on our own. We need each other just as one part of the body can't function without the other part of the body. And so the gifts, uh, Christopher, as you were saying, that the people of God are supposed to be demonstrating in the world um, are not all in one person but they are glimpsed in individuals who collectively show what it is to be a part of this body or family of Christ. Yeah, the, um, how do I want to put this? Uh, uh, There's another list, Christopher, like you were saying, it's not just this list and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. There's also a very similar list in Romans 12. or uh, The one I know in Romans 12 says, I'll just read it, We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness, which I've never really understood how compassion and cheerfulness go together, but hey, but I I think it's really important that all of these lists are representative, not exhaustive. Mm -hmm. These aren't all of the gifts of the Spirit. And like one of the things that I've always found uh, puzzling is why Paul doesn't talk about music in here everywhere. Maybe he just himself wasn't musical, but (laughs) that in worship, you know, there are musicians that have the gift of music and uh, and lead us and so on. And, And there's other ways. And so that even to start thinking about one's own gifts, uh, you can't go to these lists uh, only. You you do go to these lists. And then I have a hard question for you both that I've been asked, and I usually have a very lame answer. So some of these gifts seem ultra spiritual, like the gift of prophecy or miracles or speaking in tongues. And then some of them seem utterly mundane, uh, joy, patience, cheerfulness, uh, compassion, and so forth. How does one distinguish between natural uh, gifts that are like talents in the, in the, in the mundane sense, um, you know, um, I'm good at math or, you know, so on, and then spiritual gifts, or is it just sort of a continuum with no clear dividing line? I think I can jump in first there. I think the thing that I take away, especially as he formulates it here in 1 Corinthians, is that he's, again, these are not exhaustive lists, but they're also, I don't think, lists of gifts in general. They're lists of gifts for the maintenance and the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And so, yes, you may have joy as a, you might just be, I guess we're saying that because that's your name there, Joy. I I, I just feel (laughs) so lifted up today. (laughs) You may have, for example, patience as a personality trait, but I think where it becomes a spiritual gift is where you have patience for the loving of your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, where that patience manifests itself in the life of the church and in the life of the uh, the community. So, for example, if you did think of yourself as a patient person, that that was sort of an innate gift, but you do not demonstrate that patience in your interactions with the body of Christ, then it's not a spiritual gift anymore, I would say. That you, it's, again, as you said, kind of an innate talent. But 
when those gifts are mobilized and put into action for the building up of the community, that we see their spiritual resonance and we can understand them as spiritual gifts. In the same way that I think Paul wants to say that prophecy or these other speaking in tongues or these other, you know, quote unquote, spiritual looking things are not actually spiritual gifts if they're not used for the building up of the community of Christ. I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate following you on that. <laughs> uh, the, um, the question you asked about cheerfulness and compassion, um, Ralph, when you said that, it made me think of Mother Teresa, who we found out um, after she died from her journals that she was very depressed. And um, I'm always challenged by people who uh, find that hard to receive. When you look at the need for compassion that she ministered among to not be depressed would make me wonder about your heart. But she displayed a cheerfulness that became hope for those to whom she offered compassion so that we were surprised to find out that she wasn't always that cheerful. And I think that becomes an example of what Christopher was saying is that you might naturally be this, fill in the blank, but when you surrender it to the glory of God and the upbuilding of the kingdom, it takes on an entirely new function. And the other thing I would, I would remind us is that in ancient times, that clear distinction between what was spiritual and what was everything else was not as blatant as it, as it is for us today. It was, if I understand it correctly, it was becoming divided because of the way um, uh, Aristotle and some of the uh, Greek uh, philosophers were beginning to divide body and soul. But for ancient Judaism, that wouldn't be as distinct. Um, and we've kind of inherited that in modern times. It's really, that's really uh, helpful. Um I think I want to remind or just tell listeners also that uh, on Enter the Bible, which is a, a sister website of Working Preacher, there is a podcast uh, by Catherine Schifferdecker and Israel Kamazandu. Um, it's it's episode 6.123, which is a <laughs> strange number. Uh, but uh, And that's on the gifts of the Spirit if people are looking for another perspective on this. Um, I also will then, I, I do want to draw a connection uh, back to baptism and uh, the day of Pentecost. So mm -hmm. uh, at, right at the end of the reading, it says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greek, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. And so to note that it's in baptism that the Holy Spirit um, is, uh, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit, not to say that the Holy Spirit doesn't come to us in other ways and other places too, but that we do believe that the Spirit gives gifts and that I believe the Spirit can give people new gifts um, so that a lot of times when I hear people talk about uh, their gifts, they use it to say what they're not going to do. They'll go, that's not one of my gifts, and it's a way of turning down uh, an invitation to contribute, um, which is kind of funny. But um, the Spirit, uh, my old teacher, Jim Nestigan, used to say, God will never call you to, um, to something without providing you uh, the gifts to do it. And th uh, that means that sometimes uh, you can look inside yourself and find new gifts that you didn't know. And also, but that you have to look around yourself. Uh, the Spirit will provide you the gifts that you need to do a ministry, and that might not be within yourself, it might be in your neighbor. I think that's a good point of what Paul is saying here, that um, we need each other, and that that's what um, building up the body is all about. Um, I appreciate that. And in that negative voice, I would also remind us, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the way that they would have looked at that metaphor was to maintain the divisions. And so when Paul is saying here and in other places, we are baptized in the same baptism, 
We're basically what Love Seacrest called a new ethnos, a, a new family, a new community, community, a new culture. And in that culture, the divisions of our society, the divisions of economics, of ethnicity, of gender, no longer matter because those diversities are actually surrendered to the glory of God.